Hello and welcome to this session of Get Digital. My name is Margaret Heffernan. I'm a lecturer in human resource management here at DCU Business School, and I'm delighted to be your MC for this session. Um, throughout this week in Get Digital, we'll be exploring a range of topics related to business, leadership and entrepreneurship, with a particular focus on how businesses at all stages and of all sizes can harness transformational digital technologies to achieve their business goals. Turning to this session now, I'm really pleased to introduce our speaker, Laura Smith, Managing Director at Top Tier Recruitment, who will be talking about how to best work with recruitment agencies and digital job search strategies. So to our audience, we would love to receive your questions. So please submit them during the session using the Q&A function, uh, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Please be aware that the chat function is disabled. So please only use the Q&A option. And we will then compile the questions at the end and I will ask Laura to address as many as she can in the time that we have available. So looking forward to your questions, please remember to use the Q&A function as the chat is disabled. So with no further delay, I'll hand you over to Laura. Thanks, Laura. Thank you very much, Margaret. Hi, everyone. I'm delighted to join you all today to discuss how you can best work with recruitment agencies and the recruitment process in general. We will also address some digital job strategies, which are becoming more and more vital in this world where we are now forced to do more online and also with the ongoing advancements of technology. As Margaret said, my name is Laura Smith and I co-founded Top Tier Recruitment in January 2016. We work exclusively in fintech, blockchain and financial services industries working on finance and technology roles. We pride ourselves on our delivery commitments and always provide the highest level of service to both our candidates and clients alike. We are always open, open to helping and assisting both our candidates and clients with hiring advice and CV consultation work required. I also co-founded Possible Coaching, once completing ICF recognized coaching training. So with Possible Coaching, we provide career coaching, organizational coaching and professional coaching our combined coaching skills coupled with our hands-on handle on the recruitment market means we are in an excellent position to work well with clients across the mentioned areas. So let's get started. What a year we've all had with COVID-19 and how it has changed the recruitment scene in general. So the market literally came to a standstill back in March last year as employers tried to figure out what was happening. Some industries such as tourism and hospitality we're a lot more damaged than others. We're, we're lucky because, as I said, we work purely in financial services and fintech, so it wasn't long until recruitment kicked off again, thankfully. Everything went online immediately. So previously, the majority of interviews were conducted on a face-to-face -face basis. This meant and means that job seekers had and have a huge opportunity to interview in the comfort of their own homes without sacrificing too much time. There were a few teething problems at the beginning as people got used to the changes. Remote working was also a challenge for employers and candidates alike at the beginning, but it has quickly highlighted those who are a lot more productive than others. There is nowhere to hide anymore. People are now demanding more flexibility from their employers in the longer term as a result. We recently conducted a poll and the results were people want two to three days per week from home in the longer term. People are really enjoying the, the better work-life balance and spending a lot more time with their families. Employers have had to become more flexible as a result of COVID. It has been an opportunity for people to prove themselves and their ability to work on their own autonomy without micromanagement. We've actually seen large employers that we work with start to give up some of their leased working spaces and looking at implementing hybrid working arrangements. So for example, work from home two to three days per week and spend the remainder in the office. In this slide, we'll discuss you and your new role. So before starting any job search, it's really important you ask yourself a series of questions to ensure your job search is tailored to your niche. So for example, your industry or technical expertise. For some people, other aspects are equally as important. Questions you should ask yourself are as follows. What are your specific skills? What industries are you attracted to and why? What is really important to you in an employer? What are your own values, principles and beliefs? What motivates you? What demotivates you? 
Conducting a personal SWOT analysis is really, really helpful. So outlining your strengths and weaknesses against those of your peers, colleagues, or classmates, and then looking at opportunities and threats as a result of those. Prioritize your top skills, interests, and values as a result of, of the analysis. Then you'll be able to shortlist career options based on that analysis and list of list uh, companies that can provide you with everything based on the overall analysis that you've done. This is actually something we work through with job seekers through our coaching business, possible.ie. And it can take around two hours to fully go through it, but it is so worth it. And sometimes what you think you're looking for is not really and truly what you want from your career and life. Here we'll discuss optimizing your CV and LinkedIn profile. This is absolutely vital and it's becoming more and more vital. Now that you know exactly what you want to do based on the analysis that you conducted and we went through in the previous slide, um, you can understand that the majority of active recruitment by in-house or agency recruiters is conducted digitally on LinkedIn. So ensuring your LinkedIn profile is optimized is absolutely essential. When you're applying for a new role to a company, you must ensure your CV is also optimized for the specific role you're applying to. Specifically, you need to address and optimize the following. First thing is keywords and key points on the spec. So ensure that these are rep repeated throughout your CV. So at a glance, your application looks valid for the role. It is not enough to have a generic CV anymore. You must tailor your CV to each and every role apply to. And I can promise you this will be the difference in getting called for an interview and not. Second piece is around the summary type, summary profile and title. Again, have you optimized these pieces for keywords and adapted your previous job titles? Just to let you know, job titles do not always translate from one company to the next. So this is a really important step. It might mean that you'll have to amend a job title slightly, but it's well worth it. It better highlights that you're a relevant candidate for the role. You also need to, need to look out for the following in your CV. So the formatting on your CV, spelling, spacing, and then finally converting your, C, your CV to PDF before sending. These are all important for the overall aesthetics of the CV. I have a number of times have, have had candidates rejected from a role because of spelling mistakes and just it just looks careless. Your LinkedIn profile should be a summary of your CV, ensuring you capture keywords and, and uh, are found by a headhunter for, the per for your perfect role. So some important pieces to assess on your LinkedIn profile are, first of all, title. Can you make your title more than a title? So you should edit it with keywords again in mind and roles that you would love to be found for. Then on your experience, you need to tell the recruiter or hiring manager about your experience. Aim to include three to five bullet points under each while being conscious that you capture keywords and or key points of your ideal role. You should do this for all relevant roles. Under education, is there anything else you can add here to give the reader a better idea of what your course involved that might be relevant? So look at the qualification section of your CV. Make sure that's added in your LinkedIn piece as well. Also, if you got good marks in your degree or master's or course, you should include that. Are there any other courses, certs, training that you've done over the years that you can add here? The next piece on your LinkedIn profile is the skills and endorsements. So you need to add all the skills here that are relevant, of course, as these are keywords recruiters might be looking for and will also give a better insight into your skill set. This part is not very time consuming, so it shouldn't take any more than 10 minutes. Put in as many skills as you can think of, both from a technical and the softer skills perspective. They, they, they're equally important to be included here. On the recommendations piece, can you ask current or past colleagues or classmates uh, to give you a review on LinkedIn? So LinkedIn actually gives you an option to ask for a recommendation. This will honestly really enhance your profile and you can give them one back in return. 
again, this is something we spend a huge amount of time uh, with our clients in career with, on the career coaching side. And it's a hugely, hugely important step in finding a new role that's right for you. This is what the recruitment process in its simplest form looks like. These four steps, of course, it rarely, rarely runs this smoothly. And there are always outliers that come into play. For the moment, let's discuss the process as it is. The job search. Start as early as you can. The pro a pro like a, a process can take around three months to complete from beginning to end. It is getting better, thankfully, but it can it can take a long time. Also, another thing to note, there are busier and quieter times in recruitment. For example, summer and Christmas time are much quieter as hiring managers or decision makers tend to take time off during these periods. From a digital perspective, there are lots of things you can do to enhance your job search. You can create job alerts. So make sure that you set up job alerts from all job boards that you use, and most importantly, LinkedIn. Play around with different titles. So once you know the companies you would like to work for from the analysis that you did earlier, you can identify the titles that they recruit for and, and the jobs that you want. Networking online. So attend, att att when you're attending events, try to be there by 10 minutes before and wait until the end, 15 to 30 minutes after. See if you can get talking to, to relevant people. Attend events hosted by a hiring manager or a company that you want to work for. You can follow up with them afterwards and tell them what you really liked about their presentation and introduce yourself and why you would like to work there. Connect with hiring managers on LinkedIn and contact them directly on roles in a soft way. Don't pester them <laughs> or be too forceful. Explain what it is that you like about the company and the role he or she is, is recruiting for. Explain specifically why you would be the best candidate for that role. Another thing you could do is create a video on your profile, your LinkedIn profile, to make yourself stand out. This could be like a video CV or a video cover letter. And you could use it when sending applications or sending to the hiring manager, uh, like the above example that we mentioned. Not a huge amount of people are actually doing this, so it's a, it would be a great way to make yourself stand out. If there's any particular industry you're interested in, you can set up a Google alert so that you know a particular company is establishing um, an office or hiring in Ireland, for example. That way, you can be a lot more proactive about reaching out to hiring managers, even before roles are released. You could send them a message to say something like, I noticed you've recently announced that you'll be hiring 200 people over the coming years. I wanted to let you know I'm particularly interested in your company because of X, Y, and Z. My background is X. I would love the opportunity to have a call with you and I'll tell you a little bit more about, about myself. The next stage is the job application. So if you're applying directly, you can use LinkedIn to either contact the hiring manager as opposed to sending your email to a generic HR email address. If you spend the time composing a well-worded message, you might have a better chance in getting called to interview. If you decide to go through a recruiter, just to let you know, most graduate positions are recruited for directly as, to as opposed to um, via a recruiter, unless it's very, very specialist. We at Top Tier Recruitment recruit at a mi mid to senior level and above, so very rarely work at graduate levels. If you prefer to use an agency, research the agencies that recruit for positions at your level and within your specialist area. The benefits of using an agency is that they should be well-versed on what their client looks for and can, and can recommend CV amendments, for example. They can also negotiate your salary for you when or if the time comes. It is in their interest for your salary to be higher as the, major, the majority of time because their fee is based on a percentage of the salary offered. While the job search process can be really stressful, and I know you'll be very eager for an update on your application, be careful how you approach it. It's okay to follow up a week or so after if you haven't heard anything from the internal HR or the recruiter, 
But most of the time, both the internal person and the recruiter are waiting to, to hear feedback from the hiring managers and cannot yet provide you with an update. So following it up, up with, with them too frequently can be annoying. It can genuinely be annoying for them. So, um, so you need to believe that no news is sometimes good news. Do update them, however, if another process you're starting in um, has advanced, because sometimes this can help to speed things up. The next piece is around the interview. It is absolutely vital you prepare for an interview. The more prep you do, the better you'll feel about it and the better your performance. Simple things like researching the company outside the actual website. So you can easily Google um, the company for news and articles. Also research your interviewer. Almost everybody is on LinkedIn nowadays, so it's really, really easy to find people. And it's always great to be able to ask the interviewer questions about themselves at the end. For example, I see you started your career in X. How did you transition into the position you have today? People like to talk about themselves. Interviews are generally technical or competency based. But if you don't know what the format is going to be, prepare for both. Technical interviews can be prepared for by going through your CV and job spec forensically. Know both these documents inside out. Think about projects you worked on so that you're prepared for more general technical questions. Make sure whatever is on your CV that you can account for it and be able to articulate how you obtain the various skills mentioned. Competency-based interviews are generally ones most candidates find the hardest. Examples of competency-based questions are, give me an example of a time you handled conflict in the, in the workplace. How do you maintain good working relationships with your colleagues? Tell me about a big decision you've made recently or what has been your biggest achievement to date? You should answer these questions using the STAR method. So situation, task, action, result. And structure your answers in a useful way to communicate important points clearly and concisely. For, for every answer you give, identify the situation or task. So describe the task that needed to be completed or the situation you were confronted with, for example, I led a group of colleagues in a team presentation to potential clients. Then the action, explain what you did and how you did it. For example, we presented around 20 big, in, we presented to around 20 big industry players in the hope of winning their business. I delegated sections of the presentation to each team member and we discussed our ideas in a series of meetings. After extensive research and practice sessions, our group presentation went off without a hitch. Then finally, the result. Describe the outcome of your actions. For example, as a result of this hard work and team effort, we won the business of 15 clients. Where possible, try to relate your answers to, to the role that you're interviewing for. While your responses to the interview questions can be pre-prepared, try to avoid sounding like you're reading from a script. Don't attempt to wing it by thinking on your feet as the quality of your answers will suffer. Also avoid embellishing the truth at all costs. Any lies or invented examples can easily be checked. The key to providing successful answers to competency questions is preparation. And the good news is it's relatively easy to do. Firstly, it's essential you read and understand the job spec as we mentioned before. Next, from the job spec, Pick out the main competencies that the employer is looking for and think of examples of when and how you've demonstrated each of these. Try to draw on a variety of experiences from your studies, previous employment or any work experience you've undertaken. Familiarise yourself with the STAR approach to answering questions and practice your responses with a, fam with a friend, family member or if you're going through an agency with your recruiter. The next piece is around the offer. So when or if the time comes, you will likely know before if the role will meet your expectations from a monetary perspective. You should have a list of everything you value about a company. So the, it could be, for example, the culture, 
the flexibility around working arrangements, the perks, career progression, your own values, time, commute, working hours, just know what they are. Here's, here's an example of some questions that candidates find really awkward to answer. So it's important to, to get to, to prepare yourself, I suppose, for these uh, questions too, regardless of how you feel about answering them. So uh, why should we hire you? What are your strengths and weaknesses? Where do you see yourself in five years? What is your biggest achievement? And then as we've just covered the competency interview questions using the STAR method. Briefly on the career coaching side. So you might so you might still be finding your way with regards to what you want to do and might consider availing of career coaching to help you. Basically, what coaching does is it enables people to shift from patterns or behaviors that no longer work for them and move forward with self-developed methods that work much better. Career coaching specifically is more directive. So the approach that I would take would involve a blend of non-directive coaching and directive mentoring. However, the bulk of the benefits are experienced through coaching or in the non-directive piece. As I mentioned earlier, I have a combined knowledge of recruitment and coaching. So that combined approach of coaching and mentoring works really, really well. And also I'm constantly in the market. So I have a very real and up-to-date knowledge of the recruitment scene and can mentor people accordingly. I also completed my master's in digital marketing with DCU a few years back. So I understand personal branding and how to sell yourself, I suppose, for want of a better word, or sell your experience, your potential employer. Career coaching can generally go one or one of two ways. One, you know what you want, so we can plan for that. There may be one or two moves you'll need to take in between to get to where you want to go. Two, it could be figuring out what you like about what you do now and where that can be applied. This will be incorporated into, into an overall plan that we do with you. But we tend to um, work with you on a bespoke package covering career planning, CV preparation, LinkedIn profile optimization, job search strategies, interview preparation, internal career development, career change management. That, that's just a few examples. If you're interested in looking at any of our resources to help you with your job search, you can visit our website, top tier recruitment, go to the resources section and then the piece for job seekers. There's tons and tons of resources there. And we also have a podcast. If you want to know more about coaching, visit our website possible.ie and if you want, you can book in for a complimentary initial chemistry meeting to see if it's right for you. Thanks everybody. Feel free to ask any questions. That's great. Thanks so much, Laura, um, for such a, an interesting talk. We received a number of questions, which I'd like to get to um, straight away. Um, and just let people know that you can still have time to um, put questions <clears throat> into the Q&A function um, while I go through the questions that are, are here already. So, uh, Laura, somebody was saying, should all social media accounts be made private during the, um, the job search process? <laughs> That's a very interesting question. Um, I suppose if I would say yes, because let's face it, um, you could be posting something over the weekend that might not look very fit, that an employer might not look very favorable on. Um, I, I have an example from years back. Um, we had a candidate that was supposed to be interviewing on a Monday morning and um, just didn't show up. And it, it, it all just sounded a little bit suspect um, why they weren't there. They wanted to reschedule, but the employer actually found a tweet <laughs> that they'd put up about being in coppers <laughs> that night, that it was a Sunday night. So I would say, yes, yes. Err on the side of caution. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great, thank you. Um, so for digital jobs, is a portfolio website a must? Digital jobs, just to put my hands up, it's not my forte at all. I work purely in technology recruitment. Um, so I'm not, I wouldn't be the best person to answer this at all. Um, 
from, from like from the question I would I'd be inclined to say yes but I don't want to go into it if that's okay in too much detail because it's not my area area of uh, speciality okay thank you uh, I suppose maybe contacting recruiters who are in that area might, Absolutely. might be able to respond yeah. on that some of the bigger recruitment agencies um like CPL they might have a department that work purely on the digital side but um but yeah as I as I said throughout the presentation, if you're going through an agency, just make sure that you research them and that they cover off the jobs that um, that you want to work in. I suppose also if you're applying for a job, you know there is a contact details there, so you could always check and see. Absolutely. Do you want a portfolio website as part of my application? Yeah, absolutely. But at the same time, you do want to make yourself stand out a little bit from the crowd. So sometimes even if they don't mention it and doing that little bit extra going above and beyond is a great way to, to for you to stand out amongst um, peers. Okay, thanks, Laura. Um, somebody wants to know, do jobs still always call referees? Yes. <laughs> yes, they do. So make sure whatever uh, refer referees you're putting in are legitimate. Um, yes, I mean, like there, there are definitely some exceptions to the rule that won't. But uh, always err on the side of caution. Like any any clients we work with would always call the the, the referees. So make sure they're legitimate. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I often find it's also useful if you let the referees know that you're putting their names down. Um, Absolutely. Particularly if, if it's an academic one, because I've had students um, from large classes who I couldn't remember, and I'm listed I'm listed as a referee. So you choose somebody if it's an academic reference that sure. that knows you enough to be able to to give your quality reference. Yeah, really good point, Margaret. Mm -hmm. um, this is a really interesting one. Uh, warning signs of a toxic workplace at the interview application stage. What should people be looking out for? Warning signs of a toxic uh, workplace. So by toxic, I assume the person means that there's, you know, tons and tons of conflict going on. <laughs> I th like, I know this sounds a little bit wishy-washy, but I think you have to trust your gut instinct when you're in when you're going through an interview process. You'll know how you'll know by the hiring manager how they're speaking, and um, asking probing questions like, "What are the expectations? What do you expect from me in the first thirty days, ninety days? Like, does it sound realistic, or is it too much?" And um, you can also. Uh, before or after an interview, you can easily find out, uh, find employ employees of the company on LinkedIn and reach it, reach out to them directly just to get their insight information on how the, you know, how the culture is. Uh, checking out things like Glassdoor um, will also give you a really good insight into what the, the working culture is like. But during the interview process, I think really trust in your gut and just asking questions around like if you know what's important to you in 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 a company ask questions around that and you'll know if if, if it's the right move for you thanks laura actually glassdoor is quite useful as well yeah. in terms of trying to preempt some questions that could come up in an interview because people yes. often list interviews uh, interview questions as well yeah and it will also give you if you're going directly um it'll also give you a good idea of salaries um because people are often list that also so it's a it's definitely a really good um, website to use yeah glassdoor.com um could you tell me a little bit more about video cvs they seem to be getting more popular but what can people with little experience in videography do to keep up um i know we have like we have a a, a piece of software now i'm not i'm not that technical um but that that allows you record it but I would, I'd recommend somebody just to re research it. Oh, sorry, did we get cut off there? We're oh, okay. I'd, I'd recommend that you research, there's tons of different software that you could use. And um, basically what you're doing is giving the, uh, giving the hiring manager an opportunity to, to almost interview you or screen you without having to go through an interview process. So you're saving tons of time. Um, you're also like you're going to have to like your CV, you're going to have to make like a, a different video for each application. And um, so I would recommend keeping it to two to three minutes maximum. 
um, just giving them kind of a summary a hot overview of your technical experience and um, getting let them know your personality what really interests you why you want to work for the company you can demonstrate the the i suppose the research that you've done about the company and um, but as i said there's tons of software out there so just research what is best for you and also keep in mind that it can't like your regular cv it can, it's not enough to have a generic video or a generic cv everything needs to be tailored for each and every job so whatever software you choose just make sure it's um easy to to um, make those changes thanks laura i'm a fan of using tools like glassdoor are bad reviews something I can ask an employer about during the application process, or is that too touchy? Something along the lines of what are you doing to improve employee well-being to avoid ratings like these in the future? Thanks. Um, I think that's a little bit, it's a little bit too touchy while you're going through an interview process. If you're like sometimes last, we had a client that would scored really lowly actually on Glassdoor, and we brought it to their attention. Um, and now they have improved it uh, since but like sometimes the like glass door it's great it can be great but the majority of people that uh, that leave reviews you have to remember they are negative as well and um, i wouldn't be inclined to ask the hiring manager what i'd be inclined to do is ask your recruiter if you're going through um a, a recruitment agency or you could, um, again, reach out to people in the company and ask them for their advice. But um, yeah, you, I suppose when you're going through an interview process, you just need to be um, a little bit diplomatic and, and, and selective about the questions that you ask. Yeah, and as you said, you kind of have to look at the overall ratings. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, as you say, oftentimes the people with negative experiences are the people who will, will leave a review yeah. As opposed to people who are quite happy. Um, are there no more questions at the moment? I suppose I might ask, if you don't mind, I might ask yeah. one or two questions where, you know, do you see, is there any value in people having a cover letter? And how important are cover letters attached to CVs or cover emails? I don't, I personally don't see much value in a cover letter. I think, um, I don't, first of all, employers don't really read them, to be honest. We don't even in recruitment agencies read them. Um, what I'd be more inclined to do is focus on the summary section of your CV um, and make sure that the keywords from a job spec are incorporated into that summary. Um, I would also, moving forward with the times, I would definitely look at, um, at a video cover letter as opposed to, as opposed to a Word document. Okay. Um, and what about um, online interviews? So obviously mm. everybody's kind of coached to how to do the face-to-face -face interview, but yeah. have you any tips for people? Because definitely it, it, going forward, they will a lot of them will be online, but definitely for the next few months, yeah. um, you'll have to be doing it virtually. So any tips on things they should and shouldn't do? Absolutely. And um, if I miss, if I'm missing anything on our resource page, page on top tier recruitment, we've, we also did a blog and a podcast about Zoom interviews because um, people nearly lost their lives when everything just went literally overnight from face to face to, to video. Um, should be treated exactly the same way. Like make sure that you present yourself as you would for an interview, even if you're just dressing your top half with a, with a shirt or whatever the case may be, but present yourself really, really well. Um, make sure that the lighting is really good. Make sure that your internet is, going to, is not going to drop. This is a big bug bearer of clients of ours that they're in the middle of an interview and then the, the network drops. Um, so just try to uh, preempt anything that might go wrong with your internet or if you need to go somewhere that you know you're going to get excellent uh, connection, do so. Or if you can connect to your personal hotspot, hot but the internet is the most vital thing. Um, make sure that you're not going to be interrupted by family or a dog or <laughs> whatever the case may be. But um, just make sure that you're in a really quiet room that your background is tidy or put up a virtual background and that you're presented really well and um, 
some people think it's a great, you know, they can write everything down, write loads of notes, but they can often be so distracting and actually throw you off the course of the interview. And um, so I wouldn't recommend doing, I definitely wouldn't recommend writing down all your, all your answers. It's different if you're doing a telephone interview, you know, you can kind of refer to notes, but remember if you lose focus, if you lose eye contact, your interviewer is going to be very, very aware of that. But yeah, definitely check out, because I may have missed out a couple of things, check out our resources page. We've got it, we've got a few things on the video interviews up there. Thanks, Laura. Um, and just finally one other question I had was, you know, the you know, the use of of digital and technology in terms of shortlisting. So you mm. like you have like some of the students might be applying for large graduate programs where they had to have an application form. And then actually in the first stage of shortlisting, you know, no human being might actually look at their application. Yeah. So are there any kind of hints and tips in making sure that they they don't miss out and that they have completed the application form so that it it ensures that they will be shortlisted. Absolutely. So I, I assume, Margaret, you're talking about like uh, AI technology. AI, yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, this is going to be around the keyword optimization um, that we spoke about earlier. So just make sure that your application, your CV, whatever you're submitting is absolutely optimized to its fullest. Um, it's, it's really as simple as that. It might might mean just go, like going through the job spec forensically take like even if you have to print it out i know that's not very digital but if you have to print it out and get a highlighter and highlight the keywords or key phrases throughout and just make sure that they're mentioned and repeated throughout the application and your cv that's great thanks laura i don't see any more questions there so i suppose the key takeaway is customize everything for every that's job yeah. and prepare as best as possible yeah um, so that is that's great um i suppose before wrapping up i'd like to thank you laura um for taking no the time to give us your insightful and interesting talk um and to all of you for joining us um and for those of you that pose questions i hope you um you got the answers um and that you're you're ready to um progress your careers um so get digital will continue with our, our next session at half past two so featuring john danner best-selling author and senior fellow at berkeley haas business school so again my final thanks to you laura no um, and goodbye everyone thank you thank you bye bye bye, -bye.